on my way. He'll die alone, as will you. She's not alone. When I need your love, if I need your help, would you rescue me? Uh -huh. Would you rescue me? Oh, snap. That just happened. That just happened. Oh, man. Uh, if you guys aren't familiar, I'm, I'm a nerd, so if you're not familiar with the Avengers series, that was Infinity War. Anybody, you guys see Infinity War? Anybody? Okay, a few of you. Uh, spoiler alert, it's been out for like, you know, a year or more, but it's a dark movie, uh, Infinity War. It's a two-parter. And in that movie, there's, there's a lot of bad stuff that happens, and honestly, you see a lot of your heroes die in that movie. Spoiler alert, okay? I won't tell you who. You can go watch it on your own, but it has been out for over a year, all right? So in Infinity War, uh, a lot of heroes go, and in this uh, particular scene, I can remember sitting in the theater uh, with my family, one of at least one of which was probably dressed like one of the characters in the movie. I'm just going to put it out there. And uh, we, one by one, would see some of our characters, like, perish. And it would just be like, oh, no, you know. And, and so we got to this scene, and, and uh, what you have is you have Scarlet Witch, right? Uh, Wanda Maximoff. I'm just I'm nerding out just a little bit here. And uh, Scarlet Witch, who gets into a little bit of trouble. Proxima Midnight is the villain, and she's kind of bested uh, Scarlet Witch. She's face down in the dirt. And just when you think she's about to get it, because I'm in the theater honestly thinking, this is it for her. This is how she goes out. And these two characters show up, right? You've got um, uh, Black Widow, you've got Okoye, and, and they show up, and he's like, you're going to die alone? He's like, oh, you're not alone. And literally, like, in the theater, it erupts. Like, everyone's like, Rah! They just go completely crazy because they're like, oh, my gosh. They're there for one another, and they have each other's backs. And uh, I may have thrown popcorn uh, at the person, like, in front of me when it happened, but we were all cheering the theater erupted because we love stories where friends have each other's backs, right? Like, it's just such a cool scene. You're not alone. And so when we see that in a movie, we read that in a story, we react viscerally to that. We're just like, oh my gosh, that's so awesome. And so uh, Infinity War was like that. Uh, but, but I think each one of us wants to, to hear a story or be a part of a story where somebody has our back. And so we're in this series, I Got Your Six. And I Got Your Six is really just a military term that means I have your back. And so uh, this is a great clip to, to illustrate that. And we've talked about different qualities of friendships. We're investigating, like, what does it mean to have a strong friendship? What are some of the elements involved? And we have things like loyalty, uh, empathy, honesty. And then today we're going to tackle another quality of a great friendship, and that's encouragement. Now, I don't know, maybe some of you are sitting there going, I don't know if that's in the top 10 list of things that I want out of a friend, but I think encouragement in a friendship is super important um, because there are a lot of times in life where we just hit a wall, right? Like we, we hit a wall and we feel like, man, I, I, I'm discouraged. I don't know if I can move beyond this point that I'm at right now. And it could be something like a relationship or, or a marriage that you've invested 30 years in comes to an end. And that's after counseling and trying and and, and you're like, man, I've just hit a wall. I, I can't keep going. Um, I need some help. Or it could be maybe your job, like the, the corporate ladder that you've been climbing for years and years and years, and you've finally made it like at least close to the top on that corporate ladder, and you get the news that like your position has been dissolved. And so all of the many years of sacrifice, all of the many years of hard work 
all of the many years away from family and maybe even neglecting family, it's for nothing. Uh, your position's dissolved and, and you find yourself just going, man, I, I don't know what's next. I don't know how to pick up the pieces of this and, and move on. So maybe it's a job. It could be parenting. Oh my gosh, one of the toughest things on the planet, right, is, is parenting. And it, it could be you're a, a single mom with, with two kids and, and one of those kids starts making decisions that you never would have made. Or that you go, man, I, I wish I could help that, but right now I feel helpless and powerless to do anything about it. And, and you hit a wall and you're just like, I don't know how to speak into this any more than I've already spoken into this and I just need help and, and you, you hit this wall. And you need help getting from point A to point B, but you don't know what that is even. You add that to the environment that we live in. We live in a very like us versus them sort of world. Um, they're, they're factions, they're groups, and I, I don't know if you've felt this way, but lately I feel like even just entering into a discussion and, and talking about things that matter, you, you're kind of fearful that you're going to say the wrong thing and get blasted and get labeled a certain thing that you're like, I'm not really that, but now you've stuck this label on me. Man, this us versus them, people focusing on your weakness rather than your strengths. Like, here are all the things that are wrong with you, and you're like, well, geez, you know, I'm not just the, the summation of all my weaknesses. I'm so much more than that. And, and getting people to focus on your strengths versus your weaknesses is really difficult. Uh, we just saw a, a, a video of a marriage conference that we're doing. It's one of the things that I love best about that is that um, it, it starts of a place of strength and going, okay, this is, this is your strength as an individual, this is your strength of an individual, and this is how you can work together. It's more encouraging than, like, you stink at this part of marriage, you stink at this part of marriage, let's see if we can figure this out somehow, <laughs> right? But, but having people that focus on your strengths, that's difficult. It's difficult to find a friend that will do that. And if you live in that environment long enough, if you, if you find yourself uh, sitting in that long enough and, and soaking that in long enough, there's like an emotional, sometimes maybe like a physical or mental reaction to all of that, and it's this. You feel discouraged. I mean, feeling like I can't move beyond where I'm at right now, whether that's your job, like I'm discouraging my job or my marriage or parenting, that, that I, I, I want things to go better, but I'm unable to move it forward. And at the same time, I'm getting all of this negative feedback about who I am and, and all of my weaknesses. It is discouraging. And when you're discouraged, there's a complete and total lack of motivation to do anything about it. You probably find yourself saying things like, what's the point anyway, like a thousand times? What's the point anyway to going to counseling one more time? He's not going to listen. What's the point in me sitting down with my kid and explaining to them my side of things? They're not going to hear it. What's the point of working hard at my job when all of the work, all of the things that I contribute aren't noticed? I'm, I'm done here. I can't do any better. That's discouraging. It's not only discouraging, it's also a lie. The more that you spend time in that environment, the more that you soak in that negativity, and the more that you listen to, I'm just a summation of all of my weaknesses and I don't have any strengths, those are lies about you. It's not even true. And I know this is kind of a boogeyman type of thing, but in, I, I believe that Satan is at work in that. I know some of you don't subscribe to the devil, but I believe that evil is tangible. It can be felt, and then when you are in discouragement for too long, you begin to buy into the lie that I'm just my weaknesses, and that's it. It is discouraging, and it is a lie. And I know, that's a great uplifting message for a message on encouragement, right? You're like, dude, I thought this was going to go a different way today. But, but here's the thing, here's the thing. Uh, those are lies, and there is a way out of that. And the way out, I know you're going to be shocked when I tell you what it is, like buckle your seatbelts. When I tell you what the antidote to discouragement is, you're not going to believe this. It's encouragement, okay? I know, like, duh, Matt, like that's, that's an easy out. I know that... I know that encouragement is the way out of discouragement. Uh, and so that might not be surprising to you, but when I get into what encouragement actually is, that might change your mind just a little bit because there are a lot of things 
than encouragement is, but there are also some things that encouragement isn't. I think it's really helpful to go over those real quick. And the first thing that encouragement isn't is just a compliment. Uh, Encouragement can include a compliment, a sincere one, but it's not just a compliment. Have you ever had a friend, well-meaning, by the way, have you ever had a friend try to buoy your spirits a little bit by saying something that you go, I'm not sure that's really true about me, but thanks? Like if somebody walks up to you and goes, hey, are you on a diet? You've been working out? And I go, well, I've been going out to eat every night and uh, skipping the gym every single day. So no, it usually doesn't work in that direction. Like, it, you know, I have not lost weight. <laughs> Uh, it's a compliment. It's, it's a compliment that's made like in isolation. They don't really know you all that well. Uh, but, but encouragement isn't simply a compliment. It's certainly not an insincere compliment. It's also not false hope. Have you ever been in a really desperate situation and somebody comes up to you and they just go, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. I don't know. I've been in situations where I just go, I'm not sure that it will be okay. But thanks. <laughs> Thanks for the encouragement. Because when you are knee deep in a really bad problem, it's going to be okay. doesn't seem like a reality. Uh, Another one sometimes that you may not realize can be hurtful if you're not careful is God has a plan for all of this. Man, if you are waist deep in a problem and you see no way out of it, God has a plan for this, does not help. As a matter of fact, it might work counter purposes to what you want it to work. Like if God has a plan for this, oh, I don't know. And I don't, look, I know God works all things together for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. It's not that some of that isn't true. But when you are waist deep in a problem, you don't need false hope. And you don't need a compliment. You need encouragement. And if you look encouragement up, this is one definition of encourage, to inspire with courage, spirit, or hope. And the word encouragement comes from a French word, which means to put courage into your heart. In meaning in, cour is heart. So encourage literally means to put courage into someone's heart. So a great way to look at encourage is to to give courage to someone. So if somebody's going through a really difficult time, if they're going through uh, some heartache and they just feel like, man, I am, I am discouraged, I'm lacking courage completely, I don't have any courage, and I can't, I can't see past my problems or how to get out of this, as a friend, it's our job to put encouragement into their heart, to loan them our courage for a period of time. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about how you might do that. But I'll I'll tell you this much, that it starts with a strong relationship with somebody. You can't encourage somebody that you don't know all that well. I have a really good example. Um, I was thinking about this this week, and a a friend of mine, I I was sharing with him something that I wanted to do. It was a project. And I wanted to write something. I wanted to write a book. And so I told him, I was like, hey, um, you know, I was really thinking about doing this, but man, I'm real short on time. And I just don't know if I'm going to be able to see it through. And I just, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just running out of ideas. I'm kind of stuck. But I really want to write a book. And my friend goes, hmm. It's like, I believe you'll do that. I go, okay, well, thanks for that. But I'm telling you right now (laughs) that my schedule doesn't look like it's opening up for me to do it. He goes, no, no. He's like, I think you're going to do that, and here's why. There's not a lot of quit in you. Wow. Like, it stopped me in my tracks. And, and, And here's why. Because there's truth in it. There's truth in that about me. I might not be like the most talented writer on the face of the planet. Now, if he had started with, you know, you're going to write The Grapes of Wrath, and you're going to go on to do, you know, this little, and To Kill a Mockingbird, it'll be nothing in comparison to what you're going to write. Like, those sort of things, I'll just go, okay, ease up a little bit. You know, that's not, that's not really true. But instead, he drew something out of me that was true about myself, which is, I don't like to quit. And if I'm going to do this, I'm going to need to kind of incorporate that principle into my life. And that got me through the following week of writing. And sometimes you need to call stuff out of people, but it only happens if you have a relationship with them. It doesn't happen in isolation. And I think everybody needs a friend like that. I think everybody needs a friend who's going to call their strengths out of them and not 
super focus on their weaknesses. It doesn't mean that you don't tell them hard things at times. Of course, there are times when you have to tell a friend something difficult. But at the same time, if they are stuck and if they're in a place where they just can't see beyond where they're at, if they are completely and totally discouraged, it is your job to loan them your courage for a period of time by calling out some of their strengths. And so we've been taking a look at some friendships in the Bible. And, um, you know, we've, we've talked about... Uh, uh, Moses and Joshua, we've talked about Jesus, Mary, Martha. Uh, today, we're going to talk about Paul and Barnabas and their relationship and how it was a friendship that was really encouraging. And we're going to look in the book of Acts. Uh, the book of Acts was written by a guy named Luke. Luke was a physician and a historian. Uh, he compiled all of this information from people that uh, he met, namely Paul and the apostles and the, the story of the church. And he compiled all these notes and he put them in the book of Acts. And so I want to take a look at what he had to say about this friendship. And it starts with this. Now, Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement, and who owned a tract of land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So this is the very first time that we hear about Barnabas. I uh, haven't seen him before, but this is our first glimpse into his life. And the first thing that we see is that Barnabas is actually not his real name. Barnabas is a nickname that was given to him. You ever get a nickname? They're fun, aren't they? Like you, <laughs> you kind of get them from friends. Here's the thing about nicknames. On some level, you've earned that nickname. Like on some level, uh, some nicknames probably unfairly, like they make fun of your name, or that's, that's something else. But, but the really great nicknames that you get from friends are things that are earned. And so I asked some people that I, I knew about like some of their nicknames and, and what they got, and I, I got a funny list. Uh, one of them said, I, I used to be called the Galloping Ghost. And uh, this particular individual is about as pale as I am, right, but was in athletics. And he said, my coach would always just call me the galloping ghost. Um, uh, somebody else who's female said that her nickname was Chucky. I didn't quite understand how we got to that. But uh, as she said, it started off with Charles, and it's just a long story. And I was like, okay. Um, uh, another friend of mine uh, got the nickname Tough Buff. And I don't quite understand that, but uh, it had to do with how tough he was, like a buffalo. I don't, it, it's, you know, it just... He earned it somehow, right? I know I got the nickname Junior one time because I was in a fraternity, and the guy that was my big brother looked just like me, except more mature looking. Uh, and so I got the nickname Junior. I earned that. But, but, but Barnabas, he earned the nickname Son of Encouragement because he was, what, super encouraging. Um, son of, in our language, usually comes, uh, you know, with a different tagline at the very end. It's not usually positive or uplifting or encouraging, but uh, son of encouragement, uh, really from Jewish culture, uh, to say son of is an idiom, and it just means that you have a quality of, right? So, so son of means you have the quality of encouragement. And so Barnabas was so encouraging in his friendships with other people that it became his name. That's pretty crazy. Like, you are so encouraging that they're just like, I'm not even going to call you Joseph anymore because that doesn't really fit. Barnabas, that's your name. And that's what he was called, son of encouragement. And in this uh, passage, here's how he encouraged the apostles. Apparently, he owned a lot of land. He was uh, well-to-do. And he sold that track of land. And with the money that he got from that track of land, he gave it to the apostles and encouraged them in the things that they were doing. And the way that he did that was he put his stamp of approval on it. And he said, you know, you're spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. You're, you're, you're going to the Gentiles and you're telling them about Jesus. And I want to help you do that so bad that I'm just, I'm going to sell this land and I'm, I'm just going to give you the money. I mean, that's encouragement right there. That, that's one way to do it. And Barnabas uh, was, was called by um, a theologian that I was reading, uh, Barclay. He says, he's the man with, a, with the biggest heart. Man with the biggest heart in the church. Another great nickname, right? Like the man with the biggest heart in the church. The heart of Barnabas was so big. It was so loving towards God. It was so loving towards the disciples and the people that he interacted with that he couldn't help himself but go, how can I contribute to the work that you're doing? How can I encourage you to keep doing what you're doing? 
That was Barnabas, and that's the first time that we saw him. Now, it's not going to be the last time that we see Barnabas because there's another example of how he was super encouraging, and it's a little bit different, but it really hits the nail on the head. And it's where his life intersects with someone named Saul. Now, Saul becomes Paul later, so I'll kind of use that interchangeably. But the two lives of these guys, you've got, you've got Saul, who's a Pharisee, a bad guy. He was just a bad dude. He, he would drag people out of their homes that they uh, professed to be Christians. Uh, he was going throughout Jerusalem, and he, they were going to people's homes, dragging families out, dragging people out, and in some cases, putting them in courts, and at other times, having them murdered. And so uh, Saul was infamous in a really bad way. People knew who he was and avoided him like the plague if you were a Christian. Now, among his colleagues, he was esteemed. Everybody's like, oh man, you're doing such a great job at what you're doing. Uh, but he was, it says here, Acts 9.1, he was breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, and he went to the high priest. Uh, so in this narrative, we're going to see Saul. He is on the road to Damascus, and he's got an arrest warrant in his hand. And the reason he's going to Damascus is he's trying to stamp out Christianity in Jerusalem. He's trying to localize it and keep it localized. But people have fled to Damascus. And he's like, oh, you're not free. Like, I'm going to come and get you in Damascus. So he organizes, he gets an arrest warrant, and he goes off. And on the road to Damascus, something happens that's going to alter his future forever. As a matter of fact, he's going to go from being Saul the persecutor to Paul the apostle. And that interaction, that thing that happens to him is he encounters the person of Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. He, a bright light shines, he's struck blind, and he falls down. And in that moment, Paul cries out. He says, who are you, Lord? And he, he said, I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. And so uh, Saul went from like persecuting a group of people or a religion to a person, and that person was Jesus Christ. And he realized for the very first time what he had been doing. Jesus changed his heart, he changed his mind, and he became a follower of Jesus and then went to Damascus and he arrived. When he got there, there was a man named Ananias. Ananias uh, befriended Paul, uh, even though he was a murderer and a terrible person, introduced him to the disciples there in Damascus. Paul began to preach the gospel and tell other people about, about the death of Jesus and his resurrection. And he did such a good job in Damascus that they ran him out of town, <laughs> which can happen, right? And so he gets run out of Damascus, and he does the very thing that's like the absolute worst thing that he could possibly do, which is he goes back to Jerusalem, where his old friends were, the people that he no longer fits with, the people that now have heard that he's been preaching the gospel in Damascus and want to kill him. He goes back to Jerusalem. And so Paul goes back to Jerusalem. When he goes there, it, it, it seems like an awful decision, by the way. Jerusalem's the worst place he could have gone. Nobody wanted to touch him with a 39 and a half foot pole, just to quote the Grinch just a little bit. Like people wanted to stay away from him. They couldn't get near him. And he goes, and it's the absolute worst place you could go except for one fact. And that one fact is this, Barnabas was there. And Barnabas receives him in Jerusalem and this is the story that we're going to look at today and how Barnabas became an encouraging friend to Paul. The only redeeming quality of Jerusalem was that Barnabas was there. And he says, when he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. And so when he goes, the people that are supposed to be receiving him, equipping him, helping him in his journey are like, I'm not going near that guy right? Because this is a trap of some sort. I don't know if you guys know this Saul character, but he's really good at what he does. I think he's just trying to get us to confess so that he could drag us out of our houses and put us on trial. It's like, there's no way we're going to befriend this guy, and there's no way we're going to accept him as an apostle or disciple. No way. And Saul certainly couldn't go back to his old friends because they wanted to kill him. So one group hates his guts, and the other the other hate him for what he has become. He was a man without a country. He was a one-man wolf pack. He was the sound of one hand clapping. He's flying Han Solo. Like the guy was by himself. And get this, nobody but nobody had his back. 
He was alone. Except for one thing. Barnabas. But Barnabas took a hold of him brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. So somehow Barnabas is acquainted with what happened to him in Damascus. He knows that he was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ there and that he had stood up to those who would oppose the way, that he stood up to those who would oppose the followers of Jesus. And he preached it anyway. And He had to leave Damascus so quickly, they lowered him in a basket over a wall. That was the only way he was going to escape. Barnabas knows all of that, and he's just going, there's no way that guy would do any of that if he was lying to you. There's something about him that's different, and I need you guys to know that. And so Barnabas acts as a buffer between Paul and the apostles. And, And I'll tell you some things that Barnabas didn't do. Uh, in this passage. He didn't just compliment Paul. <laughs> hey, nice toga. Like that, that wouldn't have worked like in this situation. That kind of encouragement is not welcome. Uh, he, he didn't just tell him, hey, Paul, everything's going to be okay and walk away because <laughs> it wasn't okay. By most standards, like Paul needed help. He didn't do those things. But what he did was he accepted Paul, Warts, and all. Uh, you're going to see that, that Barnabas was well aware of what Paul had done in his past. He knew what he was guilty of. He knew how he had done it. I mean, Barnabas was a resident in Jerusalem, so he'd heard stories. But instead of shunning him, he saw that God was at work in his life, and he joined God in what he was doing with Paul. He accepted, he didn't agree with him, by the way. Can I just throw that out? He didn't say, you know what, Paul, you're right, we should kill. No, like he disagreed with him, vehemently disagreed with him, but he accepted him right where he was. How many need a friend just like that? That in your pain, in your hurt, in your discomfort, in your confusion, you just need somebody to to accept. Look, I'm a mess right now. I need you to accept me just like this. How many of us need a friend like that? That's the kind of friend that Barnabas was to Paul. He accepted him. Barnabas also saw God at work in Paul's life. So he he knew what he had done in Damascus. And it it even says in the passage that um, uh, he'd known that he had trusted in Jesus Christ and had come to Christ. And not only that, that he was proclaiming the gospel publicly. And so Barnabas knew what God was doing in the life of Paul. And he joined God in the work that he was doing in Paul's life. He accepted Paul warts and all. Barnabas saw the work that he was doing, and he saw what God was doing, namely making Saul into Paul. He's going from Saul the persecutor to Paul the apostle. Barnabas had enough vision to go, okay, this is what God is doing, and I want to join him and be a part of this. Instead of shunning him and going, man, I don't know what to do with this mess. Oh, gosh, this is too much. Instead of doing that, he said, okay, no. How can I join God at work in the life of Saul? He saw him at work in Paul's life. Here's something else that he did. He stood with him. It'd be real easy that once that revelation came out, that, that wait, isn't this the Saul that's like killing people? Done. I'm out. Isn't this the Saul that, like, he probably killed a few of their relatives? He's like, you know, isn't this that guy that's dragging people out of people's homes? Barnabas, instead of shrinking back from that and going, yeah, I guess, like, oh, what are we going to do with this guy, right? He steps in, and he steps in front of the apostles and Paul. He vouches for him. He goes to bat for him. He stands in the gap. He stood with him. And then he connected him with community. In that passage, it says that he introduces him to the apostles. He introduces him to James. He introduces him to Peter. And he's like, hey, this is Peter, this is James, this is Saul, right? And if not for that, Saul could not accomplish the mission that he was asked to accomplish, namely to get the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. He couldn't do it by himself. 
if not for Barnabas, the gospel would not have gotten to the Gentiles. Barnabas steps in. He introduces him to the other apostles. He connects him in community with other people that can help him. And here's the other thing that he does. Barnabas goes on mission with Paul, and they did life together. You see later in the book of Acts, I think Barnabas' name is mentioned something like 23 times in the New Testament. It's almost never alone. He's almost never by himself. And he's most frequently with Paul. They're getting in trouble together. They're going in cities. They're proclaiming the gospel. They're getting arrested. There's one time where they started throwing rocks at Saul, rocks at Paul, to the point that he went unconscious. They dragged his body outside of the gates for dead. Guess who was there to pick up the pieces? Barnabas. Barnabas didn't just say really nice things to Paul. Barnabas didn't just say, hey, it's going to be okay. But he vouched for him. He stood in the gap. And at the same time, he said, let's do life together. Like, let's go on mission together. Let's tell other people about Jesus. And so Paul was able to witness courage firsthand. Barnabas loaned Paul his courage for a time. He encouraged him. He did life with him. It wasn't in isolation. So that is how Barnabas encouraged Paul. Uh, It wasn't just kind words. He didn't give him a compliment or false hope. He accepted him warts and all. He saw God at work in Paul's life. He stood with him, connected him to community, and they went on mission together. It was words plus action. He was actively involved in Paul's life. And because of the courage of Barnabas, Saul became Paul. Now, with the time that we have left, I just want to talk about how we could be that kind of friend. Uh, You know, I I know we could talk about like how you could find that kind of friend, and a lot of us do need that friend in our life. We don't have it. But but I want to talk most pointedly about the fact that you need to be the kind of friend that you want to have. And to do that, you have to be encouraging, not discouraging. And so some of those things that we just directly take from the life of Paul is that we start with accepting people right where they're at, warts and all. Uh, There was a kid in my youth group, um, many years ago when I was a youth pastor, uh, every small group, we'd get together and do a small group uh, after a lesson, and every small group, he would utter the phrase, let's just agree to disagree. He just thought it was funny. I don't know why, (laughs) but it didn't matter. Hey, let's be kind to one another, you know, let's be good and, you know, give, whatever. And he'll go, well, let's just agree to disagree, Matt. Like, he just thought it was funny to introduce it into conversation at weird points. But I thought about him when I was preparing this, and I thought, you know, there are times you don't have to agree with people to accept them where they are. You can agree to disagree on big issues, but you can still love them and accept them right where they are at. And I'm telling you right now, this world is sorely missing those people that would be willing to go into uncomfortable spaces, to walk next to people who have been rejected or torn down or verbally abused and saying, you know what? We may not agree on these issues, but I'm going to walk beside you because I love you and I care, and loan them your courage for a period of time. Accept them, warts and all. Agree to disagree. Sorry. See their potential. See their potential is another thing that you can do to be encouraging. Um, Speak truth in their life. Don't focus on everything that they're doing wrong. Oh my gosh, can I just tell you for a second, being a parent's hard. Pertaining to that topic. (laughs) How many times you were like, oh, you got at the end of just railing on one of your kids and they walk away and you're like, I don't think I said anything encouraging to them the entire time we were sitting here. See the potential in other people. Don't draw out their weaknesses. Don't expose their weakness. Let me tell you something. Most people are well aware of what their weaknesses are. Not many people know what their strengths are. That takes relationship. That takes connection. That that takes you doing life together with them, but connecting with them and drawing out the strengths that you see in them and looking at what God is doing in their life and talking about that instead. Uh, One of the um, uh, illustrations that I love most is that of the surfboard, okay? Never surfed, never put my foot on a surfboard ever. You can tell that by looking at me, okay? Never been out in the sun for a prolonged amount of time, but uh, lots of sunscreen, 
Okay, it's just healthy. It's healthy. Keep the skin healthy. But um, surfing, it, it, you don't go to an area where the water is still and put your board in and sit on top of it and wait. You can. It's just not wise. Like, you're never going to start surfing if you just put your board in still water, but instead you look for waves, and you go, how can I put my surfboard in that wave and ride that wave? And I love that in, as it pertains to God working in the life of other people. You look to see where God is working in the life of those people and draw that out of them. Like, what is God doing in your life right now? But you got to know him in order to do that. You promote their strengths and not their weaknesses. You see their potential. You draw that out of them, and then you stand with them in difficult situations. Sometimes it's between them and somebody else. Sometimes it's between them and themselves. The, the way they view themselves, the, the negative talk that they've accepted, and, and uh, sometimes you have to kind of get in there and kind of go, oh, that doesn't really sound like you, and like there's hope, and God is doing something. You stand with them in difficult circumstances. And then lastly, you do life together. Because you can do all those things and just say goodbye to somebody and, and walk away. But if you walk beside them through all of that, that's encouraging. That gives strength to your heart. That get, puts courage inside of you. You do life together. That's that could be like a phone call. That could be a text. That could be, hey, let's go do lunch or let's go out for coffee. Um, it doesn't matter, but just that you're walking alongside them, that you're checking on their progress in certain situations and that you're, you're actively involved in their life. Now, I'm going to tell you something that I shouldn't tell you, okay? That'll make you listen. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you something I, I shouldn't tell you. I'm going to share something with you. Life groups don't always work, okay? I know that's a terrible advertisement for life groups. I know I probably shouldn't say that, but it's true. Life groups don't always work. Small groups don't always work. There are times when you get in a group and you just kind of go, mm, no, these are not my people, and this isn't working, and, you know, I thought there'd be more of this or more of that, or that's, that's fine. Or, or just I don't fit with these personalities. Life groups, sometimes, they don't work. But when they do, they're amazing. When they work, and when you find a group of people that you click with, and it doesn't even have to be a life group, guys. This is the crazy thing. You could find a group of people that you can hang out with that get you and you get them, and you're committed to sharing life with them and being honest with them and doing life alongside of them. It doesn't have to be a life group. As long as you find a group of people that have your back, as long as you find a group of people that will put courage inside of you, that will lift your heart and your spirit and will tell you true things, they'll draw strengths out of you and, and be a part of what God is doing in your life. If you can find those people, it's the best. Because here's the truth. Isn't it funny how the voices that you hear, those negative voices, they're never positive. They're always negative. It's never like, you're the best husband in the universe. Keep going. <laughs> you're working so hard, you're going to own this place someday. Yay. You're such a great parent. They're going to be just like you. No, they're going to be better than you. And they'll win the Parent of the World Award or something. I mean, the voices never say those things, do they? Never do. The voice instead will say, give up now, stop. It's not worth it. You've been trying and it's not working. Don't go to counseling anymore. Stop, because this marriage is over. Stop working so hard. They're not even going to recognize you. They're, they're just going to, you know, dissolve your job again. or they just, uh, just quit. The voices never tell you things like that. That's why other people are so important. You need people in your life that will draw strength out of you. You need people in your life that will tell you the good things that they see, that God at work in your life doing great things. You need those people in your life because the voices are going to keep coming. God at work in community is the most powerful thing there is. God gives us encouragement, but he also wants us to share it with other people. He wants us to loan other people our courage in times when they don't have it. In times when they don't think they can get from point A to point B, it's, it's your turn to step in and help. 
that's encouragement. It's not a compliment. It's not false hope. It's loaning someone your courage to get from point A to point B. Do you have people in your life like that? Do you have people that can speak truth into your life that will walk alongside of you? If you don't, please get in a life group or at least reach out to some people and find some people to do life together with. It's the powerful thing about the story of Barnabas is that he became known to be the son of encouragement. His name was changed. He was so encouraging. Let's be those people. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for the example of Paul in the Bible and Barnabas. God, um, an odd couple to be sure. And we would not have the gospel today if it hadn't been for Barnabas introducing Paul to the apostles. Him standing in the gap, him drawing out his strengths. God, help us to be those kinds of friends. Help us to love other people with no strings attached, to accept them right where they're at, Lord, and help them along their way to do the things that you want them to do. Help us just to put our surfboard in and surf. To find a group of people that will encourage us and we can encourage them, God. Thank you so much for the example of Barnabas. Help us to be that. And it's in your son's name that we pray.